these words. Oops, I forgot. Apparently there is a top list of forgotten things. You forget what room you went into, uh, misplace your keys, forgetting things on your grocery list, people's names when you're introducing them, uh, where you put your pen, taking meat out to defrost, forgetting to respond to an email. Sometimes it's even humorous. T take a look at these. Seems this man forgot one essential element of dressing for the day. And this one. I'll suggest that somebody probably got in trouble at the newspaper for this particular slip up. Maybe even a, a few people got in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes we're disappointed when something's left out. I mean, I personally like my Snickers better when there's chocolate inside. But it can be much more serious. Maybe it's a promised phone call, but the phone never rings. Maybe a, a responsibility promised to be done, but it falls through the cracks. Maybe a friend who is walking through a very challenging time and, well, you forget to pray, write, call, text, message, get the idea. I, I'm not really sure what makes someone feel more devalued than being forgotten. Teresa of Calcutta said the greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. End of quote. As we examine this second character in our God in the Detail series, there is a subtle and serious detail shared with us, often overlooked. So let's go with the title for this message, When Forgetfulness Has God's Fingerprints. Look at Genesis 40, verses 23 to 41, 1. But first, let's catch up with the story. You see, Joseph is favored, a favored son of, uh, of Jacob, and he receives his coat of many colors. He angers his brother with his dreams. He's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery into Egypt, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison, earns favor with the prison guard, then has two prisoners of Pharaoh, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, thrown into his cell block. Now, both those men have dreams, and Joseph interprets them properly. For the cupbearer, it's his deliverance. For the baker, it's his death. So Joseph asks one thing of the cupbearer. In Genesis 40, verse 14, he says, Only remember me when it is well with you. So now let's read Genesis 40, verses 23 and 41. 1. It says, uh, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. After two whole years... Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Now see, Joseph had asked the cupbearer to remember him when uh, he was restored to his office, but we're told the man forgot him for two long years. Now surely this must have broken Joseph's heart. I can imagine Joseph heading to his cell after the butler was released thinking, man, it's time to pack my things. And every time the doors open to that prison, I'm sure Joseph thought, it's for me. <laughs> but of course, that day didn't come, not, not anytime soon. And as the minutes turned into hours, and the hours into days, and the days into months, and the months turned into a couple years, well, Joseph was forgotten. In the words of Galadriel from Lord of the Rings, and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. See, all the while, Joseph is still in his prison, disappointed, but waiting for God to move in his time. Maybe you feel forgotten. Uh, most importantly, maybe you feel forgotten by God. This is for you. There are three things we must keep in mind when you feel forgotten. And it's found in the details of Joseph's life and even particularly here. Uh, we got God's curriculum, God's clock, and God's crown. First, God's curriculum. The Lord has a plan and a program that we can easily miss. We see a fragment of the situation it can be discouraging when we only look at the present. Now, I am no chess player. Sure, I know how to play. I know what each piece is allowed to do. And I've even spent time in countries where struggling students are required to go home and play a certain amount of chess for their homework. It's a great brain activation activity. But recently, I was learning a little more about chess masters. Amazing people. Uh, anyway, I found out that a great chess master 
will calculate 15 to 20 moves ahead, along with three to four various alternative lines that the game could take. He's always, she's always weighing the options. That baffles my little brain, but then I consider the grand master of life. God. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, we're told that his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways, but as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways, and his thoughts than our thoughts. What is God doing in his curriculum of our life? Well, he breaks our confidence in man's commitments. It's not about what man can or can't do for us. Joseph's faithfulness to man led to forgetfulness from man. It's not that he made a mistake in interpreting the dreams or even asking for the release. Rather, it's in the realization that God isn't led by man's ability to act or remember. What God ultimately wants is to break our confidence in anything or, or anyone that is not God. He wants us to rely on him, him solely, to see him as our sustenance, our stability, and our salvation. He builds our confidence in his character rather than in our present circumstances. You see, there's a hidden pathway of God's guidance. Have you noticed how God designs our life to trust? Why doesn't he show us many steps in the future? Wouldn't you just love to have the five and ten year plan laid out in front of you? But what would we do? We would look at our plans instead of at God. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path in Psalm 119, 105. It's enough to show us the next step. It's not a floodlight to show us the whole way. I love how God provided manna every day for the children of Israel, and it was only good for the day. God required a daily trust. It was the same with Elijah and with the ravens that fed him in the morning and again in the evening. It wasn't a surplus, just enough. And the second thing we have, though, is God's clock. When did God open the Red Sea for the children of Israel? When Pharaoh's army had them trapped with the imposing sea at their back? When did God save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the court of Nebuchadnezzar? No, it was in the fiery furnace. When did God save Daniel? Not until he went through the lion's den over and over. The Tally Trio has a great song that goes, He might not come when you want it, but he will be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. God's timing is perfect. You know, I think of Esther 5, where Haman has gallows prepared to hang Mordecai. It's a pride issue. But in chapter 2, it's interesting, Mordecai uncovers a plot that saves the king's life. And, and it says casually, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. That's it. No reward, no recognition, not really. Just it was written down. But Mordecai doesn't push it. Now we come to chapter 6 of Esther and there's insomnia. The king has insomnia. What does he do? He says, well, I, I want to read just my history books. I guess he thought it would put him back to sleep. Now keep in mind, Mordecai is set to be hung by Haman the next morning. Do you have that? The very next morning. Now, now watch what happens. On this night that the king couldn't sleep, uh, this is what it says. He gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found how Mordecai had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, get this, what honor or distinction has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? Have we rewarded him? Nothing's been done for him, they said. And so the king said, who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the court. Remember, Haman's the one who wants to hang Mordecai the next day. And the king's young men said, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the, the, the one to whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, well, who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then, I love this, then the king said to Haman, Haman's thinking he's going to get it, hurry, 
take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Don't you love the irony of this story? The timing of it? Mordecai, who was to be hung the next morning by Haman, is now going to be paraded through the city by Haman. And why? God's timing in it all. God's clock. Insomnia hits the king. And this, this is the result. See, I'm sure that Mordecai could have tried to push the issue much sooner, but God's clock is perfect. Had Mordecai been rewarded with silver and gold earlier, who knows how little that would have done and how quickly he would have been forgotten. But here, in Joseph's story, we have a similar narrative. Forgotten in prison, two years forgotten. How do I communicate how long this is? Well, quarantine. <laughs> it's not a pit, but uh, sometimes you feel like, man, there's no real hope of getting out. Please, for some of you, uh, thinking about two years of, of Netflix, I mean, really, if Tiger King is the best this world has to offer, I can see why it seems like a prison. Online schooling, social distancing, whatever it might be. It might be driving you crazy, but put yourself in Joseph's position. Two years in a pit, waiting on God. No, no, hang on. This is not a doctor's office kind of waiting. This is like a waiter waiting a table at a restaurant, anticipating the need of their clients, seeking to serve, seeking to obey, waiting on God. This is about faithfulness. If Joseph had been freed, no longer in prison, returned to his people, who knows? But notice, God uses an unnamed chief cupbearer to speak a word in season and then uses a prisoner to save a nation. You see that in Genesis 41 verse 9? where the cupbearer says to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. Then he goes on to share about Joseph, God's clock. But then we have God's crown, God's crown. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, uh, Joseph asks an interesting question. He says, am I in the place of God? Joseph could have been bitter. He could have tried to take it out on others, but Joseph learned something important, that God is the authority, and he didn't try to take God's place, God's throne. He didn't determine his responses in view of the person that he was receiving. He looked at God and responded accordingly. Look at the end of Joseph's narrative. Before his brothers, who had wronged him greatly, that's an understatement, he said of earthly power in Genesis 50, 19 and 20, and I already gave you part of it, he says, don't fear, am I in the place of God? Don't miss that, am I? in the place of God. And then this verse that we probably all heard, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Don't allow others' forgetfulness to lead you to assume God's place of judgment. Friends, know who you are in Jesus Christ and know whose you are in Christ. That's why I wanna end on pure encouragement. See, there is something God never says. He never says, oops. But he does choose to be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more in Hebrews 8.12. The prophet Micah tells us that he will have compassion on us, and he will, uh, he will tread our iniquities underfoot, and that he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. <laughs> Do you get that? Into the depths of the sea. The sea is often pictured as a place of judgment, but... Aren't you thankful that Christ took the depths of God's wrath? And when you come to Revelation 21.1, the first description is that there is no more sea. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. God never says oops, but God does choose to forget. That said, I can also tell you what God will never forget. He'll never forget you. In Psalm 139, 7 to 12, he reminds us that where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for, for darkness is as light with you. 
My friends, he will never leave you or forsake you, even when forgetfulness is all around you. So if you're feeling neglected, abandoned, or just forgotten, take a closer look. God's fingerprints are all over your situation.